you doing today? Fine, thank you. How about yourself? Who's back there? The brown stones. Oh, how you doing? Hi. You act like you're mine in the light and the dark. If you love me, say it. You trust me, do it. You want me, show it. If you need me, prove it. How'd you win Michael Jackson? Oh, well, um, bus. we were on this bus. No, it was traveling. a train, y'all. It was a train. It was, it was a, a bus. Plane. It was, it was a bus. bus. No, it was a plane. It was the it was bus. bus. <laughs> okay. And so, you know, Nikki was singing this note, right? She sang the melody, and then Maxie came in on the harmony, and then I came in on the high note. Right. And then all of a sudden, the bus just stopped. It was, ah, stop. And then somebody came to the back and go, you girls are really great. <laughs> I want to give you a deal. <laughs> and it was my <laughs> No, seriously, like... we, um. <laughs> <laughs> So what do you want to be the next Supreme? Do you want to be the movie? Do you want to just be awesome singer? What, what's the uh, goal? Do you want to be, I'm just trying to blow up, of course. Yeah, okay. Everybody's trying to blow up. We're just trying to blow up and, and still maintain that level of flyness, I guess. Yeah. Our next guests are three enormously gifted young divas whose debut album, uh, on Michael Jackson's MJJ Epic label has been rocking both soul and pop music audiences all over the world. Over half a million units sold and an amazing Four Lady of Soul Award nominees. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Brownstone. The, the real story is just opportunity and preparation meeting. You know what I mean? It was a wonderful um, experience to be on Michael Jackson's label. Who, who comes from Detroit? LA. LA and South America yeah, and together. gets the opportunity to meet Michael Jackson and for right. him to give us a record deal. Charmaine Maxie Maxwell was born on January 11th, 1969 in Guyana, South America. She had a tumultuous childhood and a strained relationship with her family, especially her father. But she always knew that she was born to sing and had dreams of becoming a star with hopes that one day her talent would take her far away from Guyana to the bright lights of Hollywood. Sometime in her early 20s, she decided to take a leap of faith by moving to Los Angeles and following her dream. She started attending every singing audition that she heard about throughout the city, trying to jumpstart her career and make a way in the music industry. After a while, she started to notice that she was seeing these same two women at every audition that she was going to, they were competing for singing gigs and had somewhat of a silent rivalry going on. But one day during an audition where the ladies were once again competing, they happened to be putting a group together and it required them to sing a cappella. That's when they realized that individually they were all very talented, but together they were absolutely amazing. And in that moment, something special was born. in LA they came here I grew up here and we were singing around town doing auditions trying to sing background doing cruise ships whatever to get heard and we just heard each other and loved how we sounded and we decided to put the group together right. it's all in your bones when you hear how you guys voices blend together it was, ama it was it's almost like how siblings voices kind of blend yes. That's you know amazing that we you really I mean yep. it it was just like, it came together. We didn't have to work hard at it. It was just something that naturally flowed. When we recorded, it was just magical to me. The two women that Maxie had just unknowingly made a lifelong connection with went by the names of Monica Mimi Doby from Los Angeles, California, and Nikki Gilbert, who hailed from Detroit, Michigan. She was a college student, but decided to drop out to pursue her passion of music. The three women decided to start a group together and chase their dreams of making it in the music industry as one. Even though initially they were supposed to be a quintet, with legendary singer Barry White's niece being a member, along with Maxie's friend Selena, who was from New York City. But ultimately they would settle on being a trio. One day Maxie was chilling at her studio apartment with Nikki. They were trying to come up with a name for their newly formed group. They came up with the name of Brownstone, inspired by the building structures in Harlem and spread all throughout New York City. They felt like the name represented the nature of their group perfectly. Classic and elegant, yet strong and built to last. Mimi loved the name as well, and it was ironic because she had just read the 1959 novel by Paula Marshall, Brown Girl, Brown Stones, which tells the story of a young black girl overcoming adversity 
It seemed like the name Brownstone was meant to be. This was followed by a series of events that seemed terrible in the moment, but would actually end up working in the girls' favor for their music careers. Maxine ended up booking a gig to be a model in a music video. It was being held in the California desert, and Maxine asked Nikki could she pick her up. But when Nikki was driving to the music video site, miscommunication would cause her to get lost and stranded. Eventually, Mimi would have to come and pick her up. And the guy who was holding the video shoot felt so bad about the situation, he told the girls that he had some connections and was going to set up a meeting for them with a talent agent. But after they put on their best performance, the agent wasn't impressed, nor was he interested. Brownstone left the office rejected, but on their way out they ran into two women who overheard them singing, and they were highly impressed. Linda Plum and Marla McNally owned Emerald Publishing, and they were interested in working with the girls. But first they wanted to educate them about the publishing game and music. Shout out to Linda Blum and Marla McNally, who are the owners of Emerald Forest Publishing, who we met first before we met Jerry. And there was a whole stranded in a desert story I'm not going to get into because it's long-winded. But to make up for getting me stranded in a desert, uh, they set up a meeting with this guy, Barry Kolsky. We went up and we performed some songs that we had written and rehearsed for Barry. Barry was like, thanks, but no thanks, was sending us on our way. And downstairs, the two women who owned the publishing company were like, what was that? Uh, who are y'all? What was that? And, you know, me and my Detroit... 22 year old self oh that was us i wrote these songs and hold on y'all ready come on let's sing and we sung and they were blown away and then they said can you come back next week and they came back and they said we want to introduce you to somebody but you know we want to talk to you about publishing so i had auditions mm -hmm. and um, debbie Reynolds studios never forget mm -hmm. and that is where maxi and mimi there were five of us initially mm -hmm. because i think it was barry white's niece i can't think of her name right now forgive me and this girl selena from new york who was friends with maxi and I chose the women to be a part of the group. I started writing the songs for the demos and whatnot. We started going around beating the pavement. Linda and Marla set up a very important audition for them. It was going to be held at the Sony and Epic Records building in L.A. And it was going to be with a powerful music executive named Jerry Greenberg. He loved what he heard and was absolutely amazed by their voices. Brownstone could tell by his response that he was highly impressed and wanted to work with them. So they asked him, did they have a record deal? He told them that they would have to come back for one final audition. And this was going to be big, but they couldn't tell him who was going to be in the room or who they were auditioning for. When they returned for their second audition, they were taken to a conference room. With a bright projector light shining into their eyes, they couldn't even see who was in the audience. Then they heard a voice that said, sing, and then leave. After their performance, Brownstone still wasn't sure if they had a deal. They walked away from the Sony Epic building with uncertainty. But just two weeks later, Nikki got her early morning phone call. Maxie was on the other line and she was hysterical with excitement. She told her that not only did they get the record deal, but they were signing with the King of Pop, the greatest to ever do it, Michael Jackson. He was one of the people in the room when they auditioned with the lights out. At first, Nikki didn't even believe her, but she soon realized that Maxie was for real. They informed Mimi of the good news as well and celebrated. It all seemed like it happened so fast over the course of six months. They went from individual singers who were strangers to one another trying to make it on their own to being put together by chance in a divine manner. They spoke highly of how much it meant being signed to Michael Jackson's label and how starstruck they were of the pop icon. It seemed unbelievable that they were gonna be the very first artist signed to his label. Other acts would join as well, like his nephews 3T, R&B group Man of Vision, and Tatiana Ali, most known for her role as Ashley Banks on the classic TV show Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. After signing, they immediately hit the studio to begin working on their first album. Michael Jackson's label spared no expense when it came to creating the album. They hired some of the top producers in music, including a songwriting and production duo from Denmark named Soul Shock and Carlin who were responsible for producing songs such as Monica's Before You Walk Out of My Life, Tupac's Me Against the World, and Whitney Houston's Heartbreak Hotel. Working in the studio alongside Soul Shock would be the time that Maxie would find love. According to her bandmate Nikki Gilbert, when Karsten Shack laid eyes on Maxie, it was love at first sight, and the two would become inseparable. Uh, 
what people don't know, Maxi was Guyanese, South American. To have a record on our album, that really was just straight away, like, her vibe, you know, Caribbean right. soul. If, if there was a favorite song, you know, it would be Sometimes Dancing. And the fact that it is the song that her, you know, son's father produced and her son, Nikolai, who is one of the most amazing human beings on the planet, might not have even been conceived if it wasn't for that record. So wow. special connection to that record for me. Well, okay. And, and they I'm fell sorry. in love <laughs> and wow. Nikolai was born. And life would just keep getting better for Maxi because Brownstone was on the verge of dropping their debut album. The girls were extremely excited and they already knew which song off the album was gonna take them to stardom. It was called Past the Lovin', which featured members of the group not just singing, but rapping as well. One day in the late summer of 1994, Maxine and Nikki were driving around Los Angeles and their song Past the Lovin' came over the radio. They couldn't believe what they were hearing and pulled over to the side of the road and started to celebrate. But soon a mistake would be made that would work in Brownstone's favor. While at a music industry event promoting their upcoming album, a music executive at MJJ would tell him instead of singing the song Past the Lovin' to sing a different track off the album called If You Love Me. The crowd absolutely loved the song and they received a standing ovation. After receiving all of the positive feedback, it became clear to the label that If You Love Me needed to be the single that gets pushed. And they were right, it would become Brownstone's signature song, and it would take them to stardom. Their hit single If You Love Me ruled the radio airwaves in late 94 and all throughout 95. Their single Past the Lovin' got some traction as well. Their song Grapevine became a hit too, but Brownstone wasn't done. Their song, I Can't Tell You Why, became an inescapable radio hit as well. It was a remake of a song originally created by the American rock band Eagles, which appeared on their 1979 album, The Long Run. Brownstone's version of the song would be featured on the hit 1996 film, Set It Off, starring Queen Latifah, Jada Pickett, and Vivica Fox. Brownstone's debut album, From the Bottom Up, would peak on the Billboard Top 200 in March of 1995 at number 29 but it would go on to spend 37 consecutive weeks on the charts, reaching platinum status just five months after its release. Their debut album was critically acclaimed and would receive nominations for numerous awards, including a Grammy for Best Performance by an R&B group. They received five Billboard Award nominations as well, winning one. During that time in the mid-90s, there were multiple female R&B groups, and Brownstone was one of the hottest. So what was it like working with Michael? Like, did y'all work closely with Michael or was not. it just... Okay. No, we did, we did. It wasn't like he was in the studio. Like, sing this note, Nick. Okay. But what he did do is listen to every record. Okay. What he did do is send us notes. I remember him saying, I'm so proud of y'all, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, yeah, I'm nervous. And he's like, don't be nervous. Be great. That's why we signed you. Go and be the incredible people that I signed you to be. Wow. And he was like, you've already got it. And they allowed us to just create our own record. We went, baby, we went to New York. Living it up, not knowing that shit was coming out our budget. Uh, just run, a, just run, just <laughs> run another tab. Just run like, another you know tab. Yeah, like right, I'll never it's forget. It's got to from, be like, walk, right, <laughs> right. After establishing themselves as one of the hottest R and B groups in the game, it was time for Brownstone to set out on a global tour. Their songs were rising up the charts in places like Australia, New Zealand, and Germany. But as Brownstone enjoyed their newfound fame and success. They would also experience their first setback. After their worldwide tour came to an end, group member Monica Mimi Doby announced that she was going to be leaving Brownstone. It said that it was due to health concerns, bronchitis to be exact. They immediately signed another up-and-coming singer to the group named Keena Cosper. And as a show of solidarity, there would be a changing of the guard on the legendary BET show Video Soul, hosted by Donnie Simpson. It said that this was done to show that there wasn't any issues within Brownstone, and it was simply a matter of Mimi being forced to leave due to her health. Although it will later be revealed that her departure from Brownstone wasn't as peaceful as they tried to make it seem, she did have issues with Nikki and Maxie, and over time things got so bad that she felt like she had no other choice but to leave. Well, 
we don't necessarily have a plan. We never really have a set plan. We just sit and vibe and whatever comes out, mm -hmm. comes out, you know. That's right. The Definitely. one thing I would like to do, though, is um, collaborate with some some big big producers this time. Yeah. This time, I mean, the producers that we worked with, this not to take anything away from them, they were great. Right. But this time, just to like, you know, work with Teddy, Teddy, mm -hmm. Baby Face, Baby Face, Baby. <laughs> Hey, R. Kelly, the works. Okay, so the truth is, Monica did suffer from bronchitis. That was not a lie. Okay. She, in fact, suffered from bronchitis. Um, and it made the stress of touring, especially she had fallen in love, you know what I mean? And I don't think that she was really passionate about getting her education. Her father was the vice chancellor at UCLA. So it just wasn't, she wasn't as passionate about the group. Mm -hmm. as, And as a result, it was showing itself in different ways. Contrary to popular belief, I did not put Monica out of the group. Monica made the decision that she didn't want to be there. I remember like it was yesterday. I said, Mimi, you know, she was she was just, and Maxi and I both were like, we don't think that she's really passionate about it. So we asked her, we said, why don't you think about it? Is this something that you really want to do? And she called back and she was like, I thought about it and I've decided that, you know, this is too much between this and what I'm going through with my bronchitis, I need to leave. But the remaining members of Brownstone vowed to carry on and continue their rise to the top of the music industry. So it was only right that they named their second album Still Climbing. Brownstone was focused on creating more hits for their upcoming project and avoiding the dreaded sophomore jinx. With Michael Jackson and Epic Records back in the project, Brownstone believed that they could repeat the success that they had on their first album. Still Climbing was released on June 23rd of 1997 to positive reviews. It debuted in the top 20 of the US Billboard Hot 100 R&B and Hip Hop and number two on the UK R&B album charts. It received good radio play and peaked at number 39 on the Billboard Hot 100. It was followed by two more songs off of the album, Kiss and Tell and In the Game of Love, but those singles failed to chart. And even though the Still Climbing album had solid numbers, it failed to have the same impact as their debut from the bottom up. But before Brownstone would ever get the opportunity to create a third album, there would be another departure from the group, and this time it was Maxi. According to Nikki Gilbert, it happened right before they were scheduled to perform on Keenan Ivory Wayne's late night television show. Maxi announced to the girls that this would be her last performance and that she was leaving the group. And Nikki stated that she stood there stunned alongside Keenan Ivory Waynes, who was in earshot as well. Maxie wanted to pursue a solo career, but Nikki knew that Brownstone couldn't go forward without her. So in 1998, everyone went their separate ways. Each member began to work on their own solo projects. In the year 2000, Keena Cosper released her debut album. Nikki Gilbert started to make material for her debut project as well. She also got into acting, making appearances in the movie Woo and on the classic television shows Living Single and Martin. Maxie loved being in Brownstone, but she always had dreams and aspirations of being a solo star too. She felt like the time was right. Her now husband Carlston Shack was a well-known and well-respected music producer in the industry. Maxie went on to sign a solo deal with Mercury Records. Then she decided to move across the pond to London she possessed the talent to sing smooth R&B songs or soulful ballads, but she really enjoyed singing upbeat dance tracks for the club. Her debut solo single was titled When I Look Into Your Eyes. The song peaked at number 55 on the UK singles charts. The name of her debut album was titled Where I Wanna Be, and she released a follow-up single under the same name, but it failed to chart, which led to Mercury Records making the decision to shelve her debut album effectively ending her solo career before it ever really began. After spending years in the unforgiving music industry, Maxie decided that she would put her focus and energy into her family, especially her only son. I have been looking after my nine-year-old lovely, lovely boy. Well, I'm not saying this because he's my son, but he was born with that gift playing soccer. I mean, he's absolutely amazing. He wants to be the next Ronaldo. Looks as though he will. After years away around 2007, Brownstone started to perform again. Maxie always made time to link up with her bandmates to do shows, and it was always a good time. 
Monica Mimi Doby also began to perform with the group as well after leaving years previously due to grievances and so she could pursue a career as a teacher. I'm nervous, yeah, because I want everything to go right. I'm always a very nervous person in that because I always want things to go as close to perfect as ever. But we're all humans, so do not expect us to be perfect all the time. We know that, so we will just always do our best. Things were going extremely well in Maxie's life. By this time, she had returned to the States and was residing in Los Angeles, California. But on the evening of February 28, 2015, tragedy would strike. Maxie had just returned to her residence after spending the day with her son and attending his soccer match, and she was ready to relax. While Maxie was at home enjoying a glass of wine, she decided to step out back to the patio area. But somehow on her way out, she lost her balance. The wine glass shattered on the ground, and when Maxie fell backwards, two of the pieces of shard glass punctured two different places in the back of her neck. She was at home with her son when the accident happened, and by the time her husband returned to find her and called 911, it was too late. She had lost too much blood. Maxie's death was an absolute shock to everyone that knew and loved her. The way that it occurred seemed absolutely unbelievable. Internet rumors began to spread about the circumstances surrounding Maxie's death, some people believed that it wasn't an accident at all and that it was done by her own hand, speculating that she may have been in a dark place at the time of her death due to an appearance that she had on the reality show R&B Divas. There was an episode where she made an appearance and performed with Brownstone, but it didn't go too well. She posted about it on social media and how the performance made her feel like she just wanted to go and hide. But this theory was quickly dismissed because the performance occurred in 2013, two years before Maxie's untimely demise. The spotlight was then shifted to her husband, Carlston Shack. People began to speculate that he played a role in his wife's death and that it was some type of cover-up, but the police would quickly dismiss him as a suspect and clear him of any wrongdoing. It was verified that he wasn't even home at the time of her death, and there was no history of domestic issues between the two. Maxie's husband would do an interview on the Halftime Chat YouTube channel where he spoke about his time with Maxie, how much they meant to each other, and how much her death changed his life forever. I'm so blessed that uh that we got to settle down together and at least I got some wonderful years with her and she was an amazing mom to Nikolai. She was just made to be mom. She was such an incredible mom that I could go to the studio, could do whatever. It was just incredible. And we would be singing and jamming with Nikolai and Max is just singing out of her lungs while yeah. she's cooking, you know. So he had music around him so much. Uh, but when I lost her, which was a tragic evening. But, um, but then I was alone with Nicola, and I was uh, all of a sudden, uh, I didn't know how to cook or do much. Or, yeah. And uh, I also remember going to the studio, and I was doing a high head, and I was like, this is the most, who cares? Yeah. I lost my biggest passion in life. I've lost music. I couldn't believe it. And, and uh, I took six, seven years off. In the wake of Maxie's death, Brownstone's legacy would continue to grow. In July of 2015, rapper Tory Lanez would sample their song, If You Love Me. It went three times platinum and reached number one on the Billboard charts. Brownstone's music would be used once again in 2024, when Future and Metro Boomin released their album, We Don't Trust You which also reached number one on the Billboard charts and introducing a new generation to the sound of Brownstone. When Maxie's journey began, she was just a little girl in Guyana with dreams of stardom. And thanks to her God-given talent and hard work, she was able to make those dreams come true. 
but sadly her life was taken away in a very unfortunate and tragic accident. And Charmaine Maxie Maxwell, she was only 46 years old when she died. Rest in peace, Queen.